So do you see the screen? Yes. Okay, hopefully it's visible. Okay, let's start. So the topic of our today's meeting is print media market in Western Europe. And to begin with, I would like to show you a chart on forms of print media in Western Europe. There are seven categories there, sponsorship, type, aims, target audience, form, schedule, and finally scope. Well, let's, well, let's try to fill in uh, the gaps. Let's try to uh, say what two types of media outlet uh, outlets are there if we talk about sponsorship, what types of media are there, or like, better to say, means of transmitting information, aims, target of the audience, form, schedule, and scope. Let's start with the sponsorship issue, the most controversial for media studies. Well, what are the sources of uh, well, funding for the media outlets. What are the two types of sponsorship? Can anyone help me? Government. Oh, yeah, good. So the first type of sponsorship would be government sources or public sources. Okay, then. Well, what the other? What's the other? Uh, some business uh, groups. Oh, yeah, good. So corporate, corporate funding. So if we talk about sponsorship, we have, well, Corporate funding or government funding? Is that all? Are there any other models of funding of modern media? Like sponsorship. Oh yeah, good. Like Patreon thing. Well, how is it called in general? Crowdfunding. Well, have you heard about this word? Yes. Okay, could you please explain in short what is crowdfunding? How do you understand it? Uh, when anyone? people uh, uh -huh. uh, when people raise money for uh, these like magazines or other things, uh, uh -huh. so pe people like uh, sponsor it and uh, sponsor those things that uh, they wanted to support. Oh, absolutely. So if they feel ideologically well motivated uh, by this media, they may help. They may offer donations to this media outlet. And there are platforms for doing this, like Kickstarter, Patreon, many other platforms. So, by the way, is this model viable? So do, uh, do you believe that you, well, it's possible today to create a large media source using only crowdfunding? Is it possible? It's the question. To, it's a question to everybody. How do you think? Is crowdfunding enough to create a large media outlet? I think yes. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Today there are in Russia some uh, uh, mass media that are uh, on funds of uh, supporters. Oh yeah, but I'm really I well. Frankly speaking, I, I doubt that they reveal all their sources. So, generally speaking, believe me, well, pure crowdfunding is good only for micromedia, like blogging. So, it would be possible to support uh, a, a model like this. But for something bigger than just a blogging uh, platform, well, no. You won't, you won't go far using only these funds because it's irregular and media... Yeah, well, by its very nature, it's periodical, so you just have to, uh, well, fund it regularly, but crowdfunding models rarely offer subscription models or, like, enough subscribers to sustain it, so it's not feasible. Usually, today, well, in modern Western European um, uh, in the market, uh, well, the model is mixed, so that's the first point here, that's the first thing to learn today that the sponsorship model is mixed it well combines government sources it combine well adds some corporate sources some advert advertisement income and finally crowdfunding like 30% 30% 30% and 10% for goodwill of the audience i'd put it like this it depends on the media outlet naturally but generally the model is mixed so that's the first thing to mention okay 
Well, when we talk about the medium, well, what types of media outlets are there? Um, tabloids and the quality press. Oh yeah, that's that's more uh, that's closer to target audience. I ah. mean, when we talk about type, well, it's better. Well, we have uh, well still well this uh, well in paper. How do we call them? Print. Yeah, we have print media and we have what's the second type? Well. Print media may come in two forms today, the analog one and the digital one. How do we call the digital one? Websites. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Websites, online. So it may come for, for, for using this classification of type. It may be offline, it may be online. By the way, speaking about the online forms, what are the online forms of modern media presence? What are the two major online forms? The first one, well, obviously, is a website. Anastasia, you're right. But what's the second one? Bro broadcast media. Oh yeah, but yeah, broadcast. But we're talking today about something that it, it, that uses the text, the print text. Yeah, broadcasting is okay. Well, I agree that well, streaming services are very powerful means of transmitting information. But it can. We are talking about the type of it. Yeah. A website and an app, yeah? So the second type is an application. I mean, you may download this app and use it, and by doing so, you gain access to the, well, exclusive materials of this media outlet. So speaking about type, this is offline, online, and online has two sub-forms, uh, print, uh, well, on, well, website and app. Okay, speaking about aims. What are, well, that's the most difficult one. So, uh, what can you say about the aims? What aims can this print media have? Uh, to inform. Uh -huh. Well, to, mm -hmm. to inform, yeah, to entertain, yeah, that's yeah. it. But it, I mean, end goals, yeah, we inform to, to reach what? To achieve what? What are the end goals of our activity if we work in this type of media? Generally, it's political. So the aims are political. And that's where we have this political affiliation thing. So forget about neutral media. Well, it's it's it just it doesn't happen. Yeah. So every media outlet pursues certain agenda. It may be a political agenda, some kind of, well, views on some policies. So generally it's political. But there is one more type of journalism that we should talk about, that we should talk about today. That's known as stringer journalism or investigative journalism or public interest journalism. It's something like, well, detective work. So you investigate things that are not in line with the mainstream media uh, and then you somehow, well, find a way to publish it. That's investigative journalism. So your aims might be political, or your aims might be informing the public about some pressing issues. You get it? So here we have a target audience already discussed, yeah? Anastasia, could you please say again, what two types of target audience do we have in modern media? Mm -hmm. Tabloids and uh, paper qualities. Wait, okay, quality. for quality. Yeah, quality yeah. papers, a quality press. Yeah, we have two. Okay, speaking about the form, uh, what types of print media are there? Newspapers and magazines. Oh, absolutely, magazines. newspapers and magazines. You're absolutely right. Newspapers and well, despite the fact that the majority of media outlets are now online, this difference is still there. So you may use a tablet. To read, to read a newspaper, you may use a tablet to use a, 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 well, a, a magazine, but they will be different in their design and so on. Schedule, how often? What can we say about this one? If we talk about schedule, what two types of media outlets are there? Uh, there are papers that uh, um, like 
come out uh, only mm -hmm. e, like over a day, every day, and. Uh, uh, well, day. say better to say published. Yeah, uh, published. published. Yeah, published daily. Yeah, published daily mm -hmm. or yeah. every weekend. Or oh, weekly, yeah. Oh, weekly. We, oh, okay. Or every weekend, okay. But what is the opposite? What is the opposite? We have regular periodicals in the first column, and what do we have in the second one? Okay, I'll help. That's a special issue. So this thing is called a special issue. Imagine you have a very large event, and this event is so important, so like interesting to the public, like say a World Cup or. Uh, well, a major election. Um, well, you have to create something special for your readers, and this one wouldn't be regular. It would be like unique, yeah? So it's printed only once, and usually it is very focused on a particular topic of public interest. So that's special edition or a special issue. And you may have a regular media outlet that, say, uh, be annually or twice a year or like quarterly, four times a year, prints a special issue on some specific topic that is really, really important for the, well, editor or like his co-sponsors, well, whatever. Scope, uh -huh. uh, well, uh, we're talking here about the scope or coverage. I'll start. So the smallest scope, well, is, when I talk about the smallest scope, it's about the local papers, but what other forms of, well, media do we have? We talk about scope. Tatiana, as, hmm? as Artyom said, broadsheets. Okay, broadsheets, good. But, well, Tatiana, maybe you may help us. What other, well, forms of scope do we have? Like local papers, then we have one level up. I don't know. Oh, regional papers, yeah, regional or local, regional, then we have Well, nationwide and then global. So we have like two groups of media, regional and local papers and magazines and nationwide and global magazines and newspapers. So let's have a look at this chart. It works like this. By the way, don't bother taking screenshots. I'll upload this uh, to our team. So let's have a look at this, uh, well, thing again. It mostly covers the forms of print media outlets in Western Europe so far, but not only in Western Europe, in the States, in all other countries of the world, it's more or less like this. Mm -hmm. Now, if we are to analyze the situation in a country, let's go through the list. What type of print media should we focus on? Mm -hmm. Let's go through the, the, the list. Uh, and try to answer the question, what types of, what forms of print media are interesting for us for regional studies, European regional studies? Should we go for all of them or are there any exceptions? Well, something that we should cross out. For instance, Shall we be interested in local or regional papers that cover only the situation in a small city somewhere far away, say in Normandy? No. Well, generally no. So it's not a nationwide paper. We won't be interested in like how many sheep is available this season or well, how high are the local taxes. So we, we want to be interested in this one. However, local and regional papers may be a source of very important information about the situation there in this world. If we are for some reason interested in this, uh, well, uh, land or in this district, so go local. Well, uh, our tableau is really valuable for in-depth analysis. No, because well, they yeah. attend to... Um, they tend to what? To entertain, but not to inform, yeah? So they want, they want uh, their readers to, well, have fun, but not to be more informed about the situation. So that's the problem here. 
Good. What other ex exclusions are there? What, 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 what things should we exclude? I'd say, well, for serious analysis, well, if we don't use special algorithms, are social platforms that useful? Well, yeah, sometimes we have, have eyewitness or first-hand reports, but in general, social platforms are not that interesting for like, in-depth analysis, forecasts, and so on. And by the way, it's very difficult to quote you know, a social platform information. Good. Well, let's discuss the trends in print media in Western Europe. Let's have a look at the chart to the right. Well, and answer the question, do the Europeans trust their media? The source of this data is Statista, so it's quite, I can't say it's like, I'm, I'm very satisfied with this, but for the lack of better source, it will do at, have a look. Generally in the countries, well, first of all, let's ask somebody to interpret the chart. Now look at the map of Europe. What interesting facts can we derive from the chart to the right? Anybody? Hello? Are there any trends you can see in this chart? What's the most skeptical country in Europe? More or less, the Central Europe uh, is uh, skeptical to the media, especially France. Mm -hmm. So we see that France, the, the French and the British are the most skeptical nations in Europe, so they just don't trust the media. Yeah, I, and I think uh, Italy as well. Italy as well, yeah. We have also countries of, well, uh, Countries like Greece, you see that? Greece mm -hmm. is quite skeptical. Well, and well, let's um, answer the question where do people really trust their media outlets, their media sources? In Finland. Okay, in Finland. Okay, what other countries are there in Finland. deep blue? In deep blue? And Iceland. Okay, so, well, we don't have it here. It's like it's on the map, but we don't have data on this one. This is Ireland, yeah, the Republic of Ireland. So we have Finland, the Republic of Ireland. Well, what other nations trust? The, what was this? Portugal. Portugal, indeed. So we have Portugal, Ireland, Finland. Uh, well, as places where people really believe uh, their media sources. What? Well, what can we say about Germany? Austria, Switzerland, I mean the heartland of Europe. Oh, well, Turkey also, yeah, they are, well, media, uh, well, they are very, well, well, they trust the media sources. And well, what can I say about Germany? It's somewhere in between, yeah, somewhere in between. So it peaks in Finland and it, the low is in France. This is a, well, this, these are, well, audience perceptions. So this is how the population of Europe perceives the media, but let's go through the list of trends in print media in Western Europe. And let's discuss the trends before I, well, share my opinion. Well, could you please say what is digitalization as the trend? What can you say about digitalization? Like the radio kind of print uh, newspapers and other magazines, and people tend tend to choose <laughs> subscriptions on okay. uh, digital mm -hmm. on digital uh, media. Uh -huh. so they subscribe to yeah subscriptions yes. to digital media outlets. Indeed, so they per they purchase subscriptions and they use digital uh, and social media platforms too. So that's digitalization. How do you think will this trend continue? In, in the future, or will we see kind of comeback of print media? I mean, print, print, the, the paper ones. I think it will continue mm -hmm. because it is uh, convenient yeah. to have like everything on your smartphones or uh, laptops. Yeah, it's usually even cheaper, but I would like to say, well, one, one, one very important observation to point out, one very important observation, you see, print media, I mean, the 
the media, well, the, the newspapers or magazines and paper uh, have become some kind of a status symbol. So if you can afford it, it's kind of a status symbol for, for many in Europe. Like, well, some parts of readership enjoy quality press and they do it for uh, for generations. Like this, this is my cafe, this is my political party, and this is my paper. And I buy it to support the agenda it follows. Yeah, so that's interesting because it's like theater. There were many, uh, well, enth enthusiasts of television who said, okay, well, theater will die out. It will, well, cease to exist. But uh, in reality, it lost some of its audiences, but at the same time, it became more exclusive and more of a status symbol. So I believe that print, uh, well, media, I mean, paper media, will, will go the same path, yeah? will follow the same path. They will one day become a kind of a status symbol for the readers. Okay, polarization of public opinion. Well, what's that? Any ideas? What's the controversial? Okay, okay. What are the three most controversial topics in modern European media? Maybe uh, something about Corona vaccination and oh, yeah, or, absolutely. or mm -hmm. QR codes. Yeah, well, the this well anti well lockdown measures generally well lead uh, today's uh, well uh, well topic well lists. Well, okay, what other controversial issues are, well, polarize the European public opinion nowadays? Anybody else? Ekaterina, what are topics that we see um, in Europe that, well, split the public opinion? Can I? Oh, well, okay. yes, you will, uh, you're welcome. Maybe some liberal agenda like feminism and other oh, yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's it. So, well, left versus right, I put it like this. Conservative versus liberal, indeed. And it, like, covers a lot of things. Okay, well, what else? Can we say that, say, well, the status of the European Union, I mean, Euroscepticism versus Eurooptimism is, is, a, is, a, is a very, well, polarized topic? Yes. Oh yeah, so we'll go for these three for now. So, well, obviously lockdown measures and vaccination is top one. Then we have liberal versus conservative agenda. And then we have this split over uh, the future of Europe. So will the European Union continue to develop or will some countries leave it like Brexit or, well, Brexit, all other other forms of exit, more poll exit. Good. Well, monetization of content. Well, how is it the trend? What can you say about this one? Have you heard anything about the well ad management or uh, well other forms of monetization of content? Maybe some kind of product placement. Yeah, indeed, that's product placement. That's product placement. Uh, well, we have product placement across the well articles, and so well we have it. Uh, a lot of banners, a lot of well different well, well ads that do not look like ads. Yeah, market oligopoly. Well, let's discuss this one. The word oligopoly means that there are two or three major media companies that control the market. Usually, in the majority of European countries, there are two, three, or four of them, and they control the market. Generally, oligopoly is not a good situation for 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 this uh, well for the development of free press. So, but that's the reality of today. Like influence of pressure groups and NGOs. A lot of, well, media outlets push forward some agenda, as we have learned. 
So there are no neutral media outlets. They always push forward something. The problem is it's sometimes very difficult to find out what, what is the agenda. Well, there are also different forms of biases employed for this very purpose. Corporate bias, so they, well, generally advertise some corporate structures uh, or corporate entities sensationalism. So instead of facts, they try to uh, attract public attention to some, well, sensations, celebrity gossip, well, news crime stories. Mainstream bias, it means that the, well, the media outlets usually exclude some controversial topics and they do not discuss them like some kind of conspiracy of silence. Just don't bring up, for instance, Russia if it's positive. It's always, it's almost a mainstream agenda. Okay, I'll give you just an example of this one later. Structural bias. It means that if it's established, if it's like quality press, then you're welcome. You will give an interviews, you will be welcome to the press conferences, public officials will share with you some white papers and so on. But if you, it would, well, if you are not uh, like the an established, uh, well, media outlet, well, good luck. The market will block you. Selective forms of biases, so it means that some topics are preferred over uh, other topics. So like the editors are very picky these days, so they just choose topics to discuss. And number seven, like censorship. Yeah, I know that in global ratings of press freedom, the European Union is leading and well, but well, yesterday, I will just give you one example. Uh, well, RT, tried to launch, well, RT Deutschland, the German version of this news channel. How do you think what happened? Like, uh, well, yesterday it happened yesterday. So what was the outcome of this decision? Well, just, well, give it a try if you haven't heard the news. So what happened with this YouTube channel? In Europe, in Germany, like in the middle, uh, in the it was blocked. It was, it was yeah. blocked. And it was blocked forever, like this. So they not only they block, they blocked it, but they also issued a special like declaration that, well, uh, well, go away. To to put it uh, simple, um, uh, well, that's censorship. Entertainment uh, above information. Hmm, what's that? Entertainment maybe, or information. Maybe people uh, and readers nowadays uh, prefer to read about something entertainment like uh, the lives of stars. Uh, celebrity gossip, generally yes. So even even the most uh, well serious quality press uh, well outlets try to fit in this trend and try to publish interviews with celebrities and like have special weekend special issues for this very purpose to write about music, cinema and whatnot. So uh, it's always almost evident online. So when generally it's it creates a lot of noise. So for analysis, it's difficult to filter out the unnecessary facts and to focus on the small nuggets of valuable things in the media. Good. Now let's cover the major media outlets in the jurisdictions, well, that are, in my opinion, the three most, uh, well, uh, well, I'd say the three, the three countries of the European Union were People read a lot of newspapers still. First of all, a few words about the European European media. So these two media outlets are funded by the European Union itself, by the European Commission, by the European Parliament and the European institutions. The first one is Euroactive. It's like uh, most mostly it focuses 
on information about uh, well the legal initiatives of the European Union. It's quite interesting because right there we may find some drafts, uh, well, and uh, well, drafts of regulation, some ideas about the future of the European Union. It's an interesting source of data there. Okay, next one. You observer, more more uh, focused on politics. Uh, well, it's really funny that they claim they're independent journalism because they, well, 100% reflect the views of the, well, European Commission, uh, well, in, in, in office. So they focus on policy analysis from the standpoint of Brussels, not from the standpoint of some, well, pressure groups in the nation states of the European Union, but from the standpoint of the European Commission itself. It has three versions, English, German, and French, and generally it focuses on, uh, well, a variety of issues that are important for the European Union, like the green agenda, climate change, and uh, renewable energy sources, human rights and human rights activism, then, well, taxation, future of the European Union, budgeting, migration, border control, well, so if you are interested in the opinion of the European Commission as of now, that's the way to go. That's the place to go. Okay, let's focus on the jurisdictions, yeah, on the countries of European Union. France. Well, I start with France because French newspapers are, well, one of the oldest in Europe and one of the most widely read. The two major newspapers in France are Le Figaro and Le Monde. So we see the numbers here that they lead the, uh, well, the, so to say, hit parade of media outlets in France. But they are not the only uh, papers. However, they are the most important ones. Speaking about the agenda, they are mostly, well, one of them, Le Monde, is more like center-left. Uh, the other, Le Figaro, is more or less center-right, but that's really, well, they are both centrist, so we can't say that they will publish anything really radical. This day, so, Le Monde was founded in 1944, and uh, by now it, uh, well, has become the most informed and influential of modern French newspapers. Well, other influential and widely circulating Paris dailies include Le Figaro, which is, as I have already said, centre-right, Libération, which is, well, liberal, left, so it's about, it's mostly about human rights, minority rights, and so, something like this, and François, which is a, like, general readership paper, so it's public interest paper. Now, number three, among the smaller dailies, we should mention uh, the Roman Catholic uh, paper La Croix, which is very old, and it focuses primarily on the Catholic, well, groups, yeah, so they are quite influential in rural France, and in rural France, this, Macus, this paper enjoys quite, quite the readership. So, Le Vanement, and uh, is uh, less popular nowadays as the communist paper L'Humanité, which was really influential in the 70s and in the 60s after the revolutionary events in Paris in 1968. What are the magazines that are really popular? So there are many public interest magazines, so a lot of them, and but uh, the political ones are, uh, well, Le Nouvel Observateur, uh, which is, well, political. Uh, yeah, so that's the general overview of each uh, media outlet has its website, so you may have a look at like. May I ask something? Yes, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, do these popular newspapers uh, support uh, the future presidential, uh, future candidates for presidency like oh yeah that's a, that's good question absolutely that's good that's a good question well you see french press is very politicized uh, unlike for instance german press which uh, well tries to well um, to remain to retain some kind of well at least the facade of neutrality french press was always very partisan so it always uh, it always uh, had political preferences and didn't hide it 
So if you like, you might just open a couple of, uh, um, uh, well, if you want, the front, we, we just open the front page of this newspaper and you learn what candidate do they uh, support. Like, for instance, L'Humanité would uh, support the left-wing candidates like Jean-Luc Mélenchon and, uh, uh, well, Anne Hidalgo. So that's obvious that they do it. For the La Croix paper, well, that's obviously Marine Le Pen. So, well, because she is, well, right-wing and more or less sympathetic with religious uh, groups in France. If you talk about uh, Le Monde, they will support Macron or some, uh, if we talk about Le Figaro, that would be, I mean, maybe Pécresse or, uh, well, yeah, maybe Pécresse. So yeah, they have this. For Liberation, that would be also left-wing candidates on Hidalgo and so on. So if we talk about this, uh, yeah, in France, you're absolutely right. There is a very, 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 mm, uh, well, deep connection between uh, a newspaper and the political candidate in the upcoming elections. What are the trends, the factors that characterize the French press and that characterize uh, it now? First of all, if we talk about uh, the uh, regional versus national, uh, well, daily paper market, the largest, it's a, it's, a, it's a French thing. So the largest circulation in the country, uh, well, belong, uh, belongs to the uh, regional papers. So if we compare, say, well, the total uh, popularity of some regional papers, it will easily beat uh, Le Monde and Le Figaro. So regional papers are really important because you see, uh, well, regions of France are very diverse culturally, well, are very diverse even linguistically to some extent. So daily papers, regional daily papers are really interesting uh, because they cover issues that are not, um, not um, covered nationwide. So uh, specialized magazine journalism is very popular. So there are a lot of uh, magazines and papers and websites nowadays that are very, very narrow. So they cover a very narrow uh, topic, but they do it extensively. And number three, the third trend is that since the 1968, uh, ads uh, and uh, content monetization is the trend. So. A lot of things are done in France for advertising purposes, like in many other parts of Europe, but in France it's almost evident. So that's France. Now let's cover Spain in short, yeah. So uh, really the the Spanish uh, media uh, of, of like the modern Spanish media was born in 1975, 1976, 1977 after the uh, after the death of uh, Francisco Franco, well, obviously under Franquist, under, under Franquist regime, well, freedom of press was uh, severely suppressed. The majority of uh, newspapers were, uh, well, really very right-wing and Franquist, so, well, freedom of press was non-existent under Franco. But then he died, and we know France, uh, so Spain uh, created uh, a new constitution, and this constitution guaranteed the freedom of press, so they had this boom in publishing activity. Now this boom is more or less over, and the Spanish uh, media market is very stable, so we have like five major, uh, well, um, uh, groups that control uh, the market. The most influential nation, nationwide paper is the liberal El País. It's published in Madrid and other important cities and regions, and that's the most important paper in, in Spain, followed by two other papers, El Mundo and ABC, uh, leading dailies with wide readership, so they uh, usually support different political groups, so some are, uh, well, more uh, or uh, supportive of social democrats, some are more supportive of liberal or conservative groups. So if you are interested, um, well, you may take these names and uh, create a kind of short memo for the next meeting. 
The conservative La Vanguardia paper has the widest Castilian language readership in Catalonia. So uh, the La Vanguardia is the, I'd say, royalist, right-wing, and very, very uh, uh, well uh, keen on this readership. Uh, well, usually it's like senior uh, citizens. They focus on uh, the unity of Spain as opposed to, well, some well, Catalan independence movement, Basque country independence movement. And obviously, the more or less separatist um, groups in um, uh, some regions of Spain have their own periodicals, like, for instance, Catalonia El Periodico is very popular. La Voz in La Galicia, uh, el El Correo Español uh, in the Basque Country, also printed in Castilian. And there are some smaller papers printed in Basque uh, language. So that's the overview of the Spanish media market. What are the three most important groups? Okay, the groups that I mentioned, the five of them are like this. So Prisa group controls El País, the most important paper. Then uh, Unidad Editorial controls El Mundo. Uh, Bocetto group controls ABC. Uh, Planeta group controls La Razón. And Godo group is uh, the group that publishes La Vanguardia. So five major papers that well are the source of, or more or less, these five papers cover all political opinions in Spain today, in the Kingdom of Spain today. Germany. I will focus on Germany uh, a bit because it, this uh, uh, Germany is, you should know that Germany is the largest market in Europe. So if we talk about media, uh, Germany, they still read uh, paper newspapers. They still uh, have a very strong uh, support of some uh, media by sponsoring it. So they well buy subscriptions, they buy uh, well, online subscriptions, they invest, and they really read the papers. I mean, three countries in Europe that still read uh, print papers are Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So uh, the most important, uh, well, uh, I'd say group, that controls the market is Axel Springer Verlag. It controls, like I'd say, like today, well, circa 60% of the market. Other major newspaper publishers include uh, Gruner Ja, Aktionsgesellschaft. It's a Bertelsmann company. Süddeutsche Verlag in, in Bayern, Bauer Media Group, and Hubert Buda Media. But these two groups are the most important ones, Axel Springer and Bertelsmann. So these two combined cover like 80% of the German media market. Not only newspapers, also TV channels, magazines, websites, whatnot. So it publishes many media outlets and it publishes many media outlets. Yeah, so what are the most important nationwide papers? The most widely read a uh, nationwide paper is the Die Deutsche Zeitung, which is published in Munich, Bayern, uh, Bavaria, and it's quite conservative. It's, it supports CDU CSU, if you ask me. So uh, during the previous elections, it supported Merkel. Now it was, well, quite neutral in these elections, but Still, they are right-leaning, so center-right, I put it like this. Uh, Die Welt is a liberal uh, newspaper printed in Berlin. It's, uh, it usually is Atlanticist in its political outlook, so they are pro-NATO, pro-transatlantic relations, and quite hostile to Russia. The Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung is the centrist paper, so they well try to cover all sides of well German politics, and these three are, well are the most important uh, nationwide uh, papers. But there are regional papers that are really important. For instance, the, Stutt the Stuttgart Zeitung, the Westdeutsche Allgemeine Zeitung, printed in Essen, Frankfurt Rundschau, and so on. They well they are read not only in the in the Länder. I mean, Essen and Stuttgart, respectively, like the, the city of Stuttgart and the land of Essen, well, and the, well wider. They so enjoy international circulation and respect and uh, have very popular websites. Uh, 
these were examples of quality press in papers, but as we know, Germany is an interesting place. In this country, tabloids sometimes publish very sensitive things. So you should pay attention. If we talk about Spain and France, tabloids are not uh, really um, important for political analysis, so you, you won't find anything really special there. Unlike Germany, unlike uh, the, these countries, Germany has two tabloids that occasionally publish something that is really, well, quite interesting, I put it like this. The most uh, widely and universally circulated tabloid is known as Bild. It's printed in the northern city of Hamburg and occasionally it publishes, uh, well, some um, leaks, which makes it really interesting. Uh, well, another popular tabloid is Stern, which focuses on, uh, well, domestic issues, so it's not that, uh, well, interesting, but still, sometimes. Berlin, as the capital of Germany, has many daily newspapers, including the liberal Der Tagesspiegel, which is uh, accompanied by the conservative Berliner Morgenpost, and the Berliner Zeitung, which is center-left, liberal-left. It had originally been published in East Germany, but then Berliner Zeitung was acquired by the Western press interests, and after the Wiedervereinigung, uh, swiftly gained recognition as the city's preeminent newspaper. So the most important newspaper in Berlin is the Berliner Zeitung. Well, what other uh, media outlets should we mention? The most prestigious, influential uh, quality press uh, outlet is Die Zeit. It's also printed in Hamburg, like just like Die Welt. It's, uh, I'd say, it's local, but it's, uh, it's, it's local, it's centrist, uh, and it uh, is very in-depth, I'd say. So it, it, uh, if, we, if we compare it uh, with uh, the rest of the uh, popular nationwide papers, the site, uh, uh, well, prints very large articles, very, very extensive interviews, so it wants to be comprehensive. And a special niche in Germany is occupied by the weekly magazine Der Spiegel, as you know. So this magazine is the magazine to read. It's a journalistic power in its own right, really important. And uh, uh, it uh, shapes public opinion in Germany. So what should we know about Der Spiegel? It reflects the opinion of the current uh, well, Kanzleramt and Bundesregierung as it is now. So, if we have CDU, CSU, uh, well, or the Große Koalition uh, uh, government, they reflect the point of view of the Bundesregierung and the Kanzleramt. Uh, so, it's very official. If we read something in the Spiegel, it means that this thing is interesting for the elite groups that are in control of the country right now. So there are no random publications in Der Spiegel. If something appears in Der Spiegel, it means that it is important. So I would strongly recommend you, if you are um, studying uh, German and uh, if you are into uh, well, German European studies, uh, to have a look at this paper. But you should always bear in mind that all these papers now, I mean, all of them, are, well, not the, are, are very unfriendly towards Russia. I mean, the conservative papers are unfriendly towards Russia due to Atlanticist orientation, but the left-leaning and liberal newspapers are hostile towards Russia, well, for some human rights concerns, whatnot, so should always bear this in mind. There are no neutral uh, papers in Germany, all of them follow a certain agenda. A kind of. This, uh, okay, they would. Yes. Uh, well, uh, let's stop the recording then.